Hey, cycling fans, what's up? I hope everybody had an amazing weekend. And I just want to apologize for being a day late with Joe Friel's third segment, uh, third part to our three-part series. Uh, we're working on the next high performance and intensity for the aging athletes. So you're not going to want to miss this. But before we get started, I just want to, again, apologize because we had some crazy um, weather come through on the weekend. I don't know if you've been maybe watching the news here in Canada on the eastern seaboard. Uh, we had some crazy linear storm come through and literally wipe out our power from uh, Saturday to Monday. And plus Wi-Fi is not back on some parts. And so I was actually in Tim Hortons the other day trying to process this. So just for you guys. Now, before we get into the episode, I want to remind you that I have my first edition of Cycling Snacks that you can go download for totally for free at askcoachsylvie.ca. So if you're looking for something of a healthier choice when you're out riding, other than bars and jelly beans and cliff shots, uh, this is something you might want to look at. So Check it out. I'm actually loving these snacks. They're a great alternative and they're also kid friendly. So, or I should say kid approved by my kids. So with that, have an amazing day and enjoy the episode. All right. Welcome back for another episode of Secrets and Saddle All Things Cycling Podcast with your host, Sylvie Dew. And this is the last episode uh, or a series of the three that we're do doing with Joe Friel to break down, not completely cover everything that's in his Fast After 50. I highly, highly recommend that you get the audiobook and the reading material because um, I started with the audio and it was amazing listening, but getting the all the reference material and the um, this book for the um, the tables. There's a lot of them in here. And I also, if you're training inside on whatever platform, the Ride Inside um, book is amazing as well. And you can also catch, uh, this is the second time Joe's been on the podcast. He was on previous last year. I wish I could remember the episode um, with Jim. <laughs> Jim Rutberg, which is his co-author to the Ride Inside book. So we had a, an amazing discussion, all three of us. Now, for this last episode, we are going to be talking all about high performance uh, and training and intensity. Now, we finished off episode um, or series number two with talking about some training, how to um, set up training plans differently for the aging athlete. Um, so welcome back, Joe. I'm super excited about this segment. Thank you, Sylvie, glad to be here. All right, so the first thing before we get into going back to um, talking about training plans is I had the, we have a little myth debunker here. So LSD, so long, slow distance, I think we're all familiar with that from running and cycling. And I am one of those coaches that have probably been hanging on to that, um, which I found out is not the case anymore. So, um, and basically maybe it was good for younger, but for the older athlete in keeping their performance up it's not something we want to do right joe well you don't want a continuous <laughs> diet of lsd uh, <laughs> all right you just don't want to do that all the time it does not mean that lsd doesn't have a role in your training mm -hmm. um i always call lsd an easy workout that, that may be another oh, way okay. of thinking about the same concept so you wouldn't want to have all your workouts all, all the time just easy um, we talked about that a little bit on, in one of the previous episodes where we talked about the, the research studies that I quoted in that book mm -hmm. for the athletes, some of the athletes after they were elite athletes in their twenties and they came back 20 years later to be tested and they'd done nothing but long, slow distance all the time. Uh, they had lost a considerable amount of their aerobic capacity, their VO2 max. 
because of doing that. Whereas the athletes who kept on doing some intensity, not all the time, but some intensity, maintained their VO2 max at a fairly high level 20 years later. So, so we know this works. Um, you, don't, you just don't want to do it all the time. Uh, what we want to do is we want to have a mix of workouts. We want to have some yeah. workouts that are easy and some workouts that are hard. The question is, how many hard workouts? Uh, that's usually the, the, the thing that, where people come to, to uh, different conclusions. Young athletes will typically say they can handle four workouts a week that are hard. Um, not a problem at all. Four days of training every week that are really hard workouts, like in their 20s. Older workouts, older, older workouts, older athletes realize they can't do that. They just cannot go out there four times a week and push themselves to their limits. They may try, but they realize it's no longer possible. In that case, the athlete needs to have more easy days and fewer hard days. So this concept has been pushed quite a bit since the early 2000s because of research by a, a professor in Norway by the name of Stephen Seiler. He's an American <laughs> from, from Texas. <laughs> Mr. Seiler, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, a, before, before you get into that, Joe, and I, I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We were talking about Stephen. Over the, <laughs> he's been ahead. on the podcast too. Oh, good. <laughs> um, now, when you're talking low, slow distance, I think about it's like zone one to zone two, like slow heart rate. Is that correct? Like when you're talking low, slow distance, like you're, you're in that kind of range. The intensity needs to be very low. Yeah. How you measure intensity and how accurate your measurement system is becomes the problem. Uh, for example, you mentioned heart rate. Um, yeah. Yeah, heart rate should be very low. Now, some athletes are very confused about what their heart rate zones should be. So if you're talking about zones one and two, for example, which I would agree with, if you're going to make it easy, it should be mostly all zone one, maybe a little bit of zone two because there's a hill occasionally you run into on a mm -hmm. run, for example. But it should be almost all zone one. The problem is that athletes set their zones up incorrectly because they use this formula 220 minus your age as a way to de mm. determine what your maximum heart rate is and therefore take percentages of that to come up with zones. That is not the way to do it. That is not what that is intended to be in the first place. That's been, that came out of research study in 1972, which was not intended to tell us how to set up our maximum heart rate. It was another reason altogether, I won't go into the details of the research, but it was another research reason <laughs> altogether, had absolutely nothing to do with this. And somehow, mostly the gyms, gymnasiums, health centers, spas, and such around the country took this up as a way of talking about how to make sure you get your heart rate right when you do workouts in their gym, aerobic workouts, whatever it may be. And so they came up with this 220 minus your age based on that research study. And it's to this day, it's, it's still there. It's 28, 48, 50 years after. Yeah, those charts. Those yeah. charts are still in there. Yeah. It's 50 years ago they did this research study, which was not intended for this purpose. But bottom line is, you, you've got to get your, if you're going to use heart rate zones, you got to make sure the zones are correct. Otherwise, you may be doing something that's totally incorrect. I would recommend for most people who are just trying to improve their general fitness, they're not competitive, they just want to be generally fit, is don't worry about your heart rate. Just go out and say, I'm going to go for an easy jog. I'm going to make it really slow. That's fine. If I was coaching an athlete who was new to exercise, I would say, just go slow. Mm -hmm. Well, they asked me what slow means. I'd say, well, it means you, you're, you're not, your breathing is really easy. Well, I'm not sure what easy means in this case. Now, here's, here's what you can do. Sing to yourself while you're running, um, happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you. <laughs> if, you can get, if you cannot get out all those words without taking a breath, you're running too hard slow down, even go for a walk for a while. So the idea is to, to go slow and easy um, when we're doing these easy workouts. But not all the workouts are going to be easy. Some right. are going to be hard. Um, mm -hmm. As Steven Seiler talks about, 20% he, he, of the workouts are hard and 80% are easy, which works mm -hmm. out really well. Mm -hmm. I use something a little bit different than that. I say, let's do five easy workouts a week and two hard workouts a week. It's the same concept. Yeah. So now we're working with a different set of numbers, 70, 30, but it's quite honestly, it's, it's close enough. It's good. 
two hard workouts, five easy workouts in a week is, is adequate for most athletes. Yeah. So let's go back to the heart rate because you're right. It's everywhere still on a lot of platforms. And I usually give, I usually give that formula to people who don't have their zones done for what are like any kind of testing, but I have them incorporate their resting heart rate. So then it kind of creates a more uh, personalized set of zones for them. Right. And, you know, there's the calculation out there, you, you plunk it in um, until they maybe get their, you know, their F2P or their map done as a cyclist um, for who I train. And then we just use that. And then the Borg scale is another one, you know, perceived exertion. Right. Um, but I do like that. And, you know, when I was, um, so is that, is that good? Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, <laughs> you want to, you want to make it simple and easy for people mm -hmm. to, uh, to get started in, 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 the, pro yeah. in the program. And uh, if the person has got a history in sports, so they're not coming to you, you know, from zero, they're coming to you yeah. from having participated before. Now you can do things like put them on an ergometer or put them on a treadmill and you can find out real numbers for them. Yeah. Um, if nothing else, you can say to them, you know, I want you to, to run real easy on this treadmill. So I, I want to see what your heart rates are when you run real easy. And then you gradually pick up the effort and you, so you're collecting data on them all along. And mm -hmm. then from that data you're collected, you're able to say, well, look, this is what I think your zones are going to be. And, and that means, doesn't mean they're going to be hundred percent exactly yeah. right. You may mm -hmm. be off a little bit, which is okay. But over time, you're going to refine the, the system they're mm -hmm. using so that they can exercise the intensities, which are appropriate for the level of, of their participation in sport. Yeah. Well, heart rate's one. And then we get all in, you know, that we get into Watts and power output which yeah. is a whole other story. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and testing for that? Cause that, that yeah. I imagine you use a lot for setting up your training plans. Sure. Yeah. That that's, it's the same concept we're, we're trying to find in this case, excuse me, the way it usually works is we're trying to find what the athlete's threshold is mm -hmm. now. You brought up a while ago, the Borg scale, he's got two scales. One is zero to 10 and the other six to 20. Zero to 10 works out really well with most people. Yeah. If you can, if you, if you put an athlete on a, on a, uh, an ergometer and a, a, you know, an indoor trainer and you begin mm -hmm. to increase the intensity, uh, of their ride over the course of several minutes, um, you can ask them periodically throughout, like every, every three minutes, you're going to increase the intensity, the load, but you can ask them every three minutes before you do that, how hard does this feel to you right now on a scale of one to 10, we'll say. Mm -hmm. and, and people are pretty good at doing that, especially uh, athletes who've been around sport for a while and understand what that means, what a 10 feels like versus what a five feels like and so forth. And what you're trying to find basically is seven. Where is seven? If you can find seven, then that's going to be about their threshold. So if you're doing this and they're collect, you're collecting power data while they're um, riding the ergometer, the indoor trainer, and they when they say seven, this feels like a seven. By the way, they won't say it that way. It'll be more like, <laughs> this feels like <laughs> seven. <laughs> There's a big difference between seven and five. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the way it's going to sound, and that's the number they're going to give you. And you can say that is about their, lack, their, their threshold right there, their, their functional threshold is about right there. So you can look and see what their power was at that point. You can look and see what their heart rate mm -hmm. was at that point. You're probably going to be pretty close. This is not like you're doing a scientific experiment. This is just trying <laughs> to get a ballpark number. So I've got an idea of where you're going to be. So I can, so I can set up your, your training intensity zones. Yeah. And, and then, so now I've got the zone set up. Now I can have the athlete do workouts, but even at that, you've got to talk to your athletes about sticking with the plan, the program, <laughs> whatever the workout was that day, do it that way. Mm. Most common thing that stops the athlete from keeping it easy. For example, this is supposed to be one of those easy days. Most common thing that prevents that is another athlete. If another athlete rides or runs or swims with your athlete, 
um, the workout's going to get much harder. It's no longer going to be easy. It's going to move to moderate because mm -hmm. what happens is the athletes try to half wheel each other without even thinking about it. And the next thing you know, you're going extremely hard. Everybody's breathing heavy. It's no longer the purpose of the workout. So what I've always told athletes to do in that case, you're right, you're out for a bike ride and you're doing an easy workout and it's going great. And lo and behold, you come to an intersection and you just happen to merge with another rider or group of riders. What you should do is at the first opportunity is to turn and get away from them. So you do the workout <laughs> by yourself. It's very difficult to find an athlete you can train with who's going to go easy. Very, very difficult. Right. Right. Uh, I tell athletes when I've, I do them, I, where I live, I train mostly alone, but occasionally I'll do workouts with other athletes. And when that's supposed to be an easy workout, I always tell them, I'm going to ride easy today. And here's, what that, <laughs> here's what that means. And what that means is if you start picking it up, I'm just going to let you go. I'm not going to try to stay with you because that's not going to be easy anymore. On the other hand, if it's a hard workout, I'll have just the opposite conversation. I'm doing a very hard workout today. You may not want to do this. You know, you, you tell me if, if you know what you want to do, but I'm going to do a hard workout. So I'm doing the thing that's right for me. Mm -hmm. The other athlete has to decide whether or not they want to want to do my workout or they want to do their workout. Their workout, if they're uncoached, usually means just go out and, and ride as hard as you can until you feel like you've really trashed yourself. And then it's hard <laughs> enough so you can call it quits. That's what most athletes do, <laughs> uncoached athletes. So that that's so you gotta you gotta educate your athlete, and you can tell the athlete also you can't go too slow. You cannot go too slow. If you're going for a run, you cannot run too slow. So we just go right. as slow as you possibly can. It can't be too slow. There's no such thing as too slow. <laughs> so that's the bottom line is we're trying to keep them to the low end so that when it comes time to do one of those hard workouts, mm -hmm. they can go high end. If they don't do that, then everything starts becoming mediocre and moderate, and they don't really get any benefit out of their training. Right. I know. It's like, this is just too easy. I'm like, I know. Stay there. <laughs> but it's so easy. Like, I'm like, I'm going to fall over. No, you're not going to fall over. <laughs> You'll be fine. So, and then let's move on to, um, so that was great uh, because, yeah. I mean, training zones are, are what a lot of us are following. And um, I know that I always try and get into my zone four, which I don't know. I find it super hard and it's supposed to be moderate. Oh, moderately hard or, yeah. you know, obviously. Oh, I have a question for you about zone three. Mm -hmm. Zone three i've read is like the garbage zone it's neither too low or too high it's just kind of like there and so what they've said is to not train a whole lot in zone three so i've trained i've changed up my training program to like either be like zone one zone two zone four zone five and not a whole lot of zone three what is your take on the zone three. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's mostly to be to be avoided, but there's an exception. The exception is if you're doing a race that well, requires yeah. going to zone three, you need to spend a lot of time in zone three because you're, you can, you need to return, rehearse the intensity that you're going to use in, in the event. Um, like, like for example, okay. uh, an athlete like a time trial. Around. Yeah. Could well, no time trial would probably be, depends on the length of the time trial. The length the time trial is, like 100k yeah probably zone three if the time right. trial is like 10k no not gonna be zone three no, that's it's not okay, gonna be zone no. five so it depends <laughs> on what, what the distance is that we're talking about <clears throat> but um the idea is to um is to keep the training low lots and lots of zone one and some zone two or a little bit of training up in zone five and zone four that's the two things we're aiming at yeah. so you do a hard workout now, now I'm assuming here this is an athlete who's not doing a zone three race, you know, a race that you have to do in zone three, like a hundred K time trial. Um, right. If that's the case, then the athlete um, needs to be keeping it um, to zone four or five or zone mm -hmm. one or two. That's, right. that's how I would handle. That's how I do handle that situation with athletes is try to avoid zone three. You're going to pass through zone three on the way to zone four. Mm -hmm. Do an interval workout, and, and the intervals call for zone four. 
Um, you're going to spend a lot of time in zone three because, for example, with heart rate, it doesn't immediately jump up to zone four. It gradually moves up over the course of the workout. That's where you're probably better off thinking in terms of how hard this feels, RPE. So I'm, I'm trying to hit a seven on the 10 scale, Borg's zero to yeah. 10 scale. I'm trying to hit seven. And it, it feels like a seven, but my heart rate is really in, in the zone three right now. That's okay. So it's okay to trust yourself and how it feels. If you get too tied down to numbers um, and always have to hit an exact number, especially with heart rate, it becomes um, extremely limiting. Mm -hmm. You're going to push yourself extremely hard early in the workout because of that. So you need to understand what's going on with heart rate. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Because um, I was always wondering about that. But, you know, this is what's going on now. Don't train zone three. <laughs> okay. Um, so that being said, so we we're talking about like lower end and higher end. Now, when we go to the older athlete, you talk a lot more about training in the higher end. And so that's where it goes back to your, your talking about um, the nine day training plan or the five day, uh, five, four day five, training five, plan. Five, two, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> five, two, five. <laughs> yeah, that was nine. Um, so let's talk about that because it's either, and I think personally that I might be migrating kind of, because I, I feel guilty when I do more intense stuff and less like and less long like easier rides but yeah. my training day is kind of like like i train like three times tuesday is a race thursday is a ride more higher end i guess and then a long ride like 100 like 80 100k on the weekend and then everything else is like strength training or yoga and things like that. Yeah. So you mentioned that <clears throat> I mentioned the book that older athletes need to include some higher intensity, which yeah, means like, zone, zone five type of stuff. Yeah. And again, your heart rate is not a, a good indicator of this. If you're trying mm -hmm. to use heart rate for zone five, you're basically going to try to kill yourself, you push yourself <laughs> to extreme <laughs> limits. So the best thing to do here is to think in terms of it as being more like I'm, I'm, I'm aiming for like an eight or a nine on that zero to 10 scale. If you use the power meter, a lot easier now because power responds immediately. As soon as you start mm -hmm. pressing the pedals, power comes up to the zone you're trying to achieve almost immediately, a few pedal strokes. So, uh, so yeah, I do in encourage athletes to do some high intensity training, but the problem I get into is with all athletes is they, they lack patience. Uh, if I tell an athlete, you know, so I, I'm asked occasionally, what, what's the ultimate VO2 max workout, which is high intensity. And I would say something along the lines of, well, let's say it's like five times three minutes, then it's your VO2 max, which is like um, it's about as hard as you can go. It's like a, a nine on the 10 scale. Mm -hmm. Three minute intervals with minute and a half recoveries, do five of those. That's, that's the ultimate. If I said that's the ultimate workout, what every athlete would do out there is tomorrow go out and do that workout. They've never Great. done anything at all like that ever before, but now that's the ultimate workout. So they're going to start there. <laughs> um, that, that's the problem I run into with athletes. They, they do not have patience. The reason so many athletes get injured, especially runners. Oh, we didn't talk about injury. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, like this is a good point. Yeah. Is they're impatient. They, they will not let their body adapt over time. They, they want to force it to adapt. They want to make it adapt right now. I want, I want you to... To, to be fit immediately, body, mm. you know, but it doesn't, but doesn't work that way. The body does not respond to schedules. Um, you have to be kind of coax it along and so forth. So what I would have an athlete do perhaps instead of doing five times, three minutes at high intensity with 30 second or 90 second recoveries is I would have them start out by doing two times 30 seconds at aerobic capacity with a one minute recovery. Let's do that. Warm up, do that, cool down. That's, that's your workout for today. Uh, and that's it. Not going to go any harder, not going to do any more, not going to do any, you know, any 
greater things here than just that. And then over the course of the interval, several weeks, maybe even months, I would build up to the athlete could do five times three minutes with 90 second recoveries done at their VO2 max intensity. But that would not happen overnight. So that that's the problem you get into with athletes. As soon as you say this is the workout, <laughs> that's what they do tomorrow. Uh, they're they're unwilling <laughs> to be patient. Or it's like, or I'll just add on to that little short workout with a long <laughs> ride afterwards. You're like, yeah, no, I'll do no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you warm up, do the workout, cool down, and go home. Yeah, <laughs> I know. It's it's like no, you don't need to do another, you know, twenty k to feel like you just worked out. This is a good workout. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I see what you mean. And here's another thing um, I wanted to ask since I got you here. Quali well, quality over quantity. Now, there are, you know, like, so you're talking about your 80 hour person, 80 hour a weekday person. And so they don't have a lot of time for, you know, longer trainings. They just need like, higher intense training what is your what is your opinion of that so it's like higher quality workouts versus more workouts sorry maybe less workouts but higher quality over quantity like lots of workouts yeah i think i think i understand let me see if i'm in the right place yeah, I've occasionally had athletes come to me and say, you know, um, I want to do um, a half marathon. And uh, so we go through the questions. One of the questions I ask is, well, how many hours a week can you train? Yeah, and they say they say four. Um, but I want to run a half marathon in one hour, 21 minutes. You know, and I'm 50 oh. years old. Uh, yeah, we've got, well, we've maybe got there's problem. a little bit of reality that kicks in, like that's probably not going to happen. Yeah, we, we've this year, maybe there. next year, maybe the year. Yeah, we, <laughs> maybe we start off by saying you're going to finish a 5K <laughs> uh, at that it pace, <laughs> and we're going we're to build up to doing a half marathon. But it's going to be a long time till we get there, because four <laughs> hours a week right now, quite honestly, just is just simply not enough to be able to get you ready for that. Uh, I could probably help you finish the race, a half marathon. But I don't think we're going to run 120, 121 off of a, off of a four hours a week of training. Um, <laughs> so we, we need some reality checks here to make sure we're doing the right stuff. So that's that's the conversation I would have with the athlete, and we would start from that point. Then you know if if it is okay, we settle on doing a 5K. And I got four hours a week to train. Great, we're fine now. Now what I do is <laughs> we're still going to do we're still going to do the five, two idea, for example, with this workout, yeah. with this athlete rather, maybe we're going to take one day off, probably two days off a week. That's for these easy days, still doing two hard workouts a week. So now it's, we're doing three, three easy and two hard, two days off, but I'll, I'll start at the same place. We'll just do, we'll still do the bigger number in terms of how much easy train they're doing and how much hard train they're doing it'll still be the five, two concept. So I'm not going to change that simply because they haven't got a minute, enough hours. I'm going to change the goal to be more realistic mm, is what I'm going to do. Okay. And then design the, the training to fit that, that goal. If they don't right. want to change the goal, we're not compatible. Um, right. We need to find a different coach. Um, right. I don't know who would coach the athlete under those conditions, but <laughs> maybe somebody would. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, those are pretty, uh, pretty uh, big goals. Now let's, um, let's talk about periodization for a little bit, maybe just to tie it, tie a bow on it. Um, and with like, with regards to putting together um, your training plan, like just say like an, a nine day, nine day, because when I was reading that, like I mentioned to you, it was like mentally wrapping my head around that different number over a seven day, which we're so ingrained on seven, you know, the work day seven, we get everything seven, we start over the next week and, and things like that. But periodizing that over like your four weeks, and now it's much long, like the time frame is extended considerably because if you add you know 
uh, an extra 16 days on that. Can you talk on that? Or sure. is that a big question? No, that's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, let's, let's, instead of calling this periodization, let, let me change the language a little bit. Okay. Let's just call it planning. Uh, <laughs> that's what periodization really, at the most is, basic yeah. level, that's what it's all about, is just planning mm -hmm. out your season. Mm -hmm. um, when we say periodization, the reason I, I tend to get away from using that word anymore is because we've now got, there's a backlash, mm -hmm. an anti-periodization backlash going on. Really? Um, yeah, it has for several years now. It's gained steam, though. And, and oh, they've got no a point. <laughs> the point is that among the anti-periodization folks is that we're uh, we're creating plans that we follow uh, blindly without ever thinking our way through them, which is not true. But that's kind of the way people have come to see periodization as being set in stone. And once I've got it on paper, I've got to do it. And that's not the way oh. it is. So it's really just a planning process is all it is. And, and mm -hmm. it became called periodization because in the early days, there were things we did in various periods of the, of the year. Right. Um, mm -hmm. that, and so therefore it became known as periodization because there were types of workouts you did during one period, but not another period, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But if you just call it planning, it takes away all that, that, that uh, challenging issues that come up with some folks. So anyway, long story, but the bottom line is um, that when you come up with a, with a plan for the athlete to, to train on, what I like to do is think of it in terms of being um, uh, on-demand training. So in other words, if the athlete is tired uh, because of what they did last week, then I'm going to take an easy week this week, regardless of what the plan calls for. Mm -hmm. so it's on demand. In other words, the athlete is telling me, or I'm seeing, maybe, maybe I'm seeing this because of their data online, that I just reviewed their data and I can see they're fatigued. What I'll do then is say, okay, we're, we're just going to uh, take some easy days here and give you a chance to recover, regardless of what the plan says. And that's the way it should always be. You come up with the plan, but the plan is pointing you in the right direction. It's going to change. We all know that. It's never going to stay the same. Point you in the right direction. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, adjust as we go along all the time on the fly and always um, revising the plan mm -hmm. so that we're still going to come to race day ready to go, but I'm going to get you there from, in a different path than the path we'd originally planned to take. So um, if an athlete could do that by themselves without a coach, they're doing remarkable things because most athletes don't have the, uh, the um, patience don't have the uh, willingness to trust themselves on such things. They doubt themselves that I'm, am I really tired? You know, that that's the sort of thing they'll say. It's maybe I can still do that workout. I'll go out and give it a try and see what happens. Whereas the coach, a good coach will say, you know, let's not do that at all. Let's do this instead. Let's just take it easy. And we'll mm -hmm. do that other workout when you're ready for it. But you're not ready for it right now. I always told athletes when I was coaching them, if you weren't sure you were supposed to do an ath uh, workout, you could call me, but I can tell you the answer right now. The answer is don't do it. So you don't have to call me. <laughs> you know the answer already. So, yeah. Can I? So it, it just can saves I a really? lot of problems. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah no. So it just solves a lot of problems because you can just make a decision yourself now because I'm going to say don't do it. Because anytime there's a question about whether or not you should do an ath a workout, the athlete needs to realize there's something going on in their mind or their body which is saying there's a problem here. It may not be obvious, but it's it's enough for me to say, gosh, let's not do it. And let's just be on the safe side. Better to be safe than sorry is the old saying. Oh my gosh, I so agree with you. Last night, for instance, I'm texting with my girlfriend who we're on the same race team and she's been, she hasn't been able to train or race and she's, and she's dealing with some, like one of her kids who has some health um, issues anyway and she's been up at night and she's like you know I, I'm just like I'm like don't do it it's it's not worth it there's so many other races out there like and she's like she's complaining about how her knee is super sore I'm like like and you want to go race like are you mad I go what if you can't walk tomorrow I mean it's not worth it and what did she do she went and she participated i didn't see her in the in the lineup thank god she's probably behind me but like in the in the crowd and uh and she's like yeah i know i wasn't gonna finish it 
She's like, I'm going to do it, but I know I'm not going to finish. I'm like, well, why are you bothering? And your knee's sore and it's going to make it worse tomorrow. And I'm just like, I felt like if I was beside her, I would slap her upside the head and go, I don't know what you were thinking, but that was like a really, like, I hate to say the word dumb, but a really dumb decision to participate when you know you're not going to finish, you're already feeling sore and tired, and we need you next week. So, you know what? And I'm just like, uh, I was so mad. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, and, and just like, yeah, I'm icing my knee now. I'm like, yeah. I hope you can walk on that because yeah, that's planning on design or planning on, 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 uh, on need. When you, when you need to take a break, you take a break. When you need to work out hard, you work out hard. Yeah. You, or you just realize you're just not ready. Yeah. You know, you might need a little bit more time and it's okay. I think, I think a lot of us put a lot of pressure on ourselves to perform, perform for groups, FOMO, you know, all this stuff plays in so many roles that, you know, we, and we just don't have the power to say no. Wouldn't you agree? Right. Like it just, um, <laughs> especially in the online platform, you know, how easy is it to just jump online and ride with a group and push yourself more than you need to when you should be resting or going to bed earlier? I agree. You know? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. We should talk more about that. <laughs> That's what this, but ride inside's all about. <laughs> That's was like, know your limits, take your time. But this, um, yeah, so we've covered so much, uh, Joe. I just want to um, say thank you for taking the time. I know that you're so busy with that new project. Do you want to talk a bit about that project before we sign off? Briefly, share yes. everybody briefly yes <laughs> not too many details but yeah i uh for probably the last eight to ten years i've been thinking about writing a book for coaches um kind of stuff i've learned and didn't learn over the years um all in <laughs> one place and i couldn't find a publisher though because the covid thing screwed has changed the publishing industry considerably and uh so companies are changing the way they look at the possible the, the probability that a book will do well regardless so they, they didn't consider my book to have a big enough audience so consequently i was turned down like by three different publishers which is the first time it's ever happened to me so i'm kind of like telling a friend of mine who had been in the publishing industry and she was working for a company in colorado that's involved in sports and she went to them and told them about my idea and they said hey we'll do that so it's not going to be a book. It's going to be a multimedia project. So it's going to be, it's going to be articles I've written. It's going to be interviews I've done with people. It's going to be um, roundtable discussions of coaches. It's going to be athletes' views of their coaches. It's going to be just slideshows. Wow. It's going to be kind of like everything. It's going to take me a year and a half to put it together. I'm about five months into it right now, um, and it's coming along really well. Um, so it, 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 it's a, just taking a gigantic amount of my time, primarily right now, because I'm going on a, on a business trip next week, oh. leaving on Sunday. So I can't work for, for, uh, four days. And I get back from that. And two days later, I go on vacation with my wife for two weeks to, to Europe. So I've, I've got to get all this work done before I leave. So we don't lose aren't behind schedule by the time I get back. So right now I'm really working harder than I should be. Well, I'm certainly grateful for you taking the time to fit this in because um, I, when I went through that, I'm just like, I need more elaboration. I think this would be great for my audience um, who are all cyclists and training and riding and racing and, and, and things like that too. And plus, as we get older, I don't think we realize that we need to slow down or maybe, you know, we, you know something happens and we have to slow down, which is not really what we want to do, like injury and, you know, illness and things like that. So if we could prevent it, then getting this book into more people's hands, um, I thought that would be really good. And so I thank you so much for taking this time. And I look forward to that platform because that's where everything is, right? Online. <laughs> All yeah. your new cycling coaches will be able to access that and, uh, and do great things with their clients. So 
I hope all of our listeners has really enjoyed um, and you've caught all three of these segments with Joe Friel. Um, certainly grateful, as I said, to have him here. Make sure you follow him on Twitter and um, our podcast on Instagram, uh, Secret Stone Saddle Podcast, and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you very much, everyone. Have an amazing day. All right, this is the epic one. I am so excited that he explained because as we get older, we always want to stay faster and excel at cycling. And how do you do it properly without breaking down your body? Um, I just love this episode. and I'm so grateful for Joe for doing this for me and being part of this series and talking more in depth about his book. Make sure you go and get it and implement some of the things that he suggests. You'll be amazed at how your body feels and becomes resilient. I know I'm feeling like that and I'm going to continue doing what I've been doing, taking more rest and being more cognizant of the whole picture. Take care and have an amazing day and share this with your friends. Thank you so much for spending this time with me on the Secrets from the Saddle podcast. Learning more about sighting people, places, and things that make cycling such an exciting sport. I am so glad you stopped by today. Please leave me a review if you feel so moved to do so. I would love to hear your feedback. And if you could take one second to share this episode with someone you think would enjoy it, I would be forever grateful. Also, if you could please leave me a review, if you feel so moved, by going to iTunes and leaving me an honest thought and an honest comment, telling me what you think, and most importantly, tell me what you'd like to hear more of. It would really help me to bring more great, inspiring cycling stories to you. Until then, have an amazing day. Make sure you ride your bike. And don't forget to visit my YouTube channel if you'd like to see the full version of this podcast live.